So I bet before you heard about this talk, you probably didn't know fungus sex is a thing. Well, it is. In fact, it kind of puts us to shame in terms of its sheer sexiness. <laughs> fungus sex gets pretty freaky, not just in terms of how it goes down, but also in terms of its major consequences for humanity. So you're probably wondering how a seemingly well-adjusted guy got so into fungus sex. It all started about three years ago, when I decided, in my wisdom, to leave my cozy apartment in Seattle, Washington, and drive five hours into the middle of nowhere to get my master's degree studying mycology. I had applied to Washington State University, and when I arrived at the campus 10 minutes from the Idaho border, I walked up the hill to my lab building, and I looked out around me. As far as I could see, there was nothing but wheat. So it kind of made sense that I'd be working on a wheat pathogenic fungus. Stinking smut of wheat, Talisha carries. Smut kind of brings some dirty thoughts to your mind, but it's actually called this because it's German for dirt. And, you know, the stinking part is kind of an interesting story as well. On my first day in lab, my advisor came up to me and held out this envelope and said, Sean, smell this. And normally when people say, Sean, smell this, I tend not to do it, but <laughs> as a fresh grad student, you just want to make your advisor happy. So I took this little envelope and I took a big whiff of the smut spores, and it was just like the nastiest dead fish smell like ever. And I carried this around in my mustache all day, and it was great. <laughs> and so here I am at UBC for my PhD, and I'm still working on smut. So I've developed a smut addiction, but um, anyway, let's talk about sex. So, <laughs> so I'm assuming most of you probably know some stuff about sex, um, but I'm just going to go over the human sexual cycle just for review, and also because we have a lot in common with how fungi have sex. So humans, um, we have chromosomes, right? And we have a set from our mom and a set from our dad. And when we go through sexual reproduction, our chromosomes all line up, and they line up with the one from the other parent, and they swap pieces. And this is this thing that you can see at the bottom left-hand side of the slide. It's the swapping of the bits of the chromosomes. And this is really important for sex because it generates genetic diversity. And then this is part of a larger cycle of sexual cell division called meiosis. And this is what ends up producing eggs and sperm in the ovaries and the testes. So each of these gametes has one shuffled half-size copy of the parental genome. And when they merge, it goes back to being two copies. And this forms the diploid zygote, which grows into an you know, adult human. So fungus sex is pretty similar to this. So fungi have a body, and it's called a thallus. And this is not the same as a phallus. But in order to have sex, two fungi have to touch their thalli and merge into one glorious thallus. This is the process that you can see happening at the left hand and bottom of the slide. Once a fungi, a two haploid thalli merge into a diploid thallus, they go on to produce mushrooms, or some other kind of fruiting body. So when you eat a mushroom, you're basically eating the fungus's sex parts. This, yeah, yum, right? This is, <laughs> this is the organ responsible for producing uh, gametes. These are spores for fungus, but they're essentially analogous to our sperm and eggs. And so basically, the mushroom has three key purposes. Carry out meiosis to produce spores, protect the spores while they develop, and then efficiently disperse them into the environment. So over time, a huge variety of different fruiting structures have developed to accomplish this purpose. And the really amazing thing about all of these fruiting structures is that they can produce billions and billions and billions of spores. And this is just like one of their key advantages in sexual reproduction, is this ability to produce massive numbers of inoculum. So how do fungi decide if they want to get it on? Well, like us, they have sexes. And so in order to successfully reproduce, two fungi of different sexes usually have to get together. So there's a wide range in numbers of sexes. For example, the stinking smut fungus has just two or three, 
whereas the corn smut fungus has somewhere between 25 and 50, and some mushrooms have many, many more, as you can see from these other ones with like 18,000. That's crazy. What does that even mean, to have 18,000 sexes? Well, it basically relates to how the fungi... <laughs> <laughs> so when, when we like, make our sperm, right, an X chromosome goes into one sperm and a Y chromosome goes into another. And so that is pretty deterministic of the biological sex of the fetus. However, fungi don't have sex chromosomes like us. Their mating genes are just on regular chromosomes, so they can go through crossing over, which means that they can shuffle around. So imagine these two mushrooms have, like, two sex-determining genes each, AA and BB. And they can have sex because they're different. Each one, each letter is different. So they, you know, do it, and then we have some baby mushrooms. And a couple of them are the same sexes as the parents, but then the other two are recombinant sexes. So you'll notice that because these guys share the same letter with both parents, like A can't have sex with the parent with A, and B can't have sex with the parent with B, and also their siblings, that they're new, distinct sexes. And the point of this is outcrossing, because fungi can't like, really think about who they're having sex with. They need to find some other mechanism to make sure that incest doesn't occur, because incest defeats the purpose of sexual reproduction. You want to have like, a wide variety of advantageous traits that result from sex via genetic recombination, and you want to avoid accumulating lots of crappy mutations in your genome. So why is this important? Well, for a really long time, basically all of recorded history, humans have been fighting fungal blights on crops and other plants. And fungi are well adapted to eat crops. So for example, this particular sad-looking tree is an American chestnut. And between 1900 and 1950, four billion American chestnuts were wiped out by one fungus in the southern and eastern United States. This is just kind of one example of the virulence that fungi can have on plants. And it's not even that bad of an example. Fungi cause tens of billions of dollars of losses to agricultural crops every single year. And humans are always trying to find ways to fight back against this, whether this is breeding plants to be resistant to fungi or spraying fungicide. It's always a problem. Money isn't the only problem, though. We get 59% of our calories from just four staple crops, rice, wheat, corn, and potatoes. Each of these is subject to severe blights. Most of you are probably familiar with the Irish potato famine. Between 1847 and 1855, one million Irish people died of starvation, and over two million emigrated. The population of that country still has not risen above what it was in 1847. If you look at corn, the worst blight in U.S. history was caused by a sexual fungus that attacked corn. This corn had been bred to be resistant to this fungus, but a single sexual recombination event allowed the fungus to overtake these resistance genes and destroy 15% of the U.S. corn crop. Wheat. In the year 2000, in the Pacific Northwest, wheat that had been specifically bred to be resistant to stripe rust was again subject to infection due to a sexual recombination event. And rice, the most important source of calories, is also subject to infection by a sexual fungus, rice blast. Once it's established in a field, you just can't get rid of it. So this can get pretty nasty, and we're still dealing with this right now. Currently, UG99 stem rust, which emerged in Uganda in 1999, has spread all the way to Iran, and threatens the wheat-growing areas of India and Pakistan that are responsible for the production of over 20% of the world's wheat. Again, this fungus arose through a sexual recombination event. So as if it wasn't bad enough that fungi want to eat our agricultural crops, they also want to eat us. This little cryptococcus cell is smiling because he is currently chowing down on a lot of people that are suffering from HIV-AIDS. Every year in Africa, this opportunistic infection kills 600,000 people and sickens a million. It's pretty bad. And recently, closer to home, a new chapter has emerged in this disease. 
Cryptococcus gadii emerged on Vancouver Island in 1999. Unlike Cryptococcus neoformans, it infects healthy individuals. This fungus is extremely dangerous, causes very, very bad meningitis. You definitely don't want it. It's endemic in the soil, and it's spread to the neighboring states of Washington and Oregon. This fungus is capable of having sex with itself. I know people are too, but it's not quite the same thing. <laughs> This, this leads to the production of offspring, and these offspring demonstrate traits like increased thermal tolerance and resistance to antifungal drugs. These are key virulence factors on human hosts. The fact that increased thermal tolerance is a result of this same-sex mating is particularly dangerous because the six seasons that preceded the emergence of Cryptococcus gadii were extremely dry and warm. And as the climate warms, and we see more of this type of weather patterns, this puts a strong selective pressure on fungi to develop the ability to grow at a higher temperature. Humans maintain a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. This is pretty much like a lot higher than the ambient environment. So it's difficult for fungi to colonize us. But as they're forced to live in a hotter and hotter environment, it'll make it that much easier for them to jump to hotter and hotter hosts like us. We can look forward probably to more of these types of outbreaks as climate changes. So what's the takeaway? I think humans have this tendency to sort of put ourselves on a pedestal, thinking that we're somehow separate from the world around us and the environment. You know, we're pretty good at sex for a primate. There are seven billion of us walking around that can attest to that. But fungi can produce seven billion spores on one mushroom. So you know, they have a pretty strong advantage when it comes to sex. They're much better at it than us. They also want to eat all the same food as us. They're trying to eat our crops. They're trying to eat us. So, you know, as far as they're concerned, we're just a carbon source. And I think that we need to leverage the advantage that we have over fungi, our intellects, to make better choices about natural resource management, environmental management, and agricultural management so we stay one step ahead of these sexy, sexy fungi. Thanks a lot.